Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, shares, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome back to another episode of ACNS Webinars. The speaker for the first session of today is our honored guest from China, Dr. Yi Yang. Dr. Yang is the Deputy Chief Physician at the Beijing Tiantan Hospital, China. She is the Vice Chairman of the Brain Network Group of the Neuroprosthetic Branch of the Chinese Medical Doctor Association. She is also the Society Secretary of the National Medical Center for Neurological Disorders, Medical Center for Disorders of Consciousness Physicians Alliance. She is a member of the Cranio Cerebral Trauma Consciousness Disorder Group of the Chinese Association of Rehabilitative Medicine and member of the Neuroregulatory Committee of the Chinese Association of Research Hospitals and member of the Nerve Injury and Repair Branch of Chinese Society of Neurosciences. She is a member of the Standing Committee of Neurosurgery Branch of Chinese Association of Women Physicians and Secretary of the Consciousness and Consciousness Disorder Branch of the Chinese Neurosciences. We are extremely honored to have her today at a webinar and she will be talking about spinal cord stimulation for disorders of consciousness. The speaker for the second session is our honored guest from the USA, Dr. Samuel Browd. Professor Browd is the director of the Seattle Children's Hydrocephalus Program, the medical director of the Seattle Children's Sports Con Concussion Program and the director of Sports Institute at the University of Washington Medicine. He is a member of the AANS and has been honored with the title of the best doctors of Seattle more than once. He specializes in treating children who have hydrocephalus, brain and spinal cord tumors, pediatric cervical spine, spina bifida, chiari malformation, and spasticity. He is an invited faculty to several workshops and conferences around the world and he has published several articles in various peer-reviewed journals. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars and today he will be talking about dorsal selective rhizotomy. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Germany, Dr. Georgios Mattis. Dr. Mattis is a senior consultant for neurosurgery and he leads the chronic pain and spasticity sector of the Department of Stereotactic and Functional Neurosurgery in the University Hospital of Cologne. Dr. Mattis is a member of the German Neuromodulation Society and International Modulation Society. He serves as a reviewer for many international journals and is on the editorial board member for neuromodulation technology at the neural interface and interventional pain medicine and neuromodulation. Dr. Mattis is involved in many international clinical studies and has been active as instructor for many co colleagues in Germany and abroad. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the first session of today's webinar. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Japan, Professor Nobuhito Morota. Professor Morota is the Associate Prof Professor, Director, Division of Pediatric Neurosurgery at the Kitasato University School of Medicine, Sagamihara, Japan. Professor Morota specializes in the field of pediatric neurosurgery, functional neurosurgery, brainstem and spinal surgery, and intraoperative neurophysiology. He is the executive board member of the Japanese Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery, Pediatric Neurology, and Spinal Surgery. He is also a member of the Asia Australis Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery. He is the integral part of the ISPN in, and he is also on the editorial board of the Child's Nervous System. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting an invitation to chair the second session of today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China and we are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Lubun Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today and with that introduction I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Georgios Matis. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from Cologne, greetings. Once again a small correction, I'm not a professor, only a senior consultant. Thanks for having me. For me, it's a great honor and at the same time, great joy to participate in this webinar because, as you most of you know, spinal cord stimulation is a great passion of mine. And you know, spinal cord stimulation is not a new therapy. We have this therapy since 1967. We have been using it to treat neuropathic pain. There are many publications now showing that it could be useful for treating also mixed pain syndromes. We use it for peripheral vascular disease for complex regional pain syndrome, for many other indications. Now we have some more exotic indications such as treating patients with respiratory problems, spinal cord injury patients. We can implant lints and help patients who are on mechanical ventilation, for example, or we can help patients with disorders of consciousness. This is a really exotic indication. In Central Europe, we don't have a great experience in this indication. This is why I'm really excited to hear the talk of Dr. Yang, who is an expert in this uh, field and her main 
research interests are neuromodulation, disorders of causes, and rehabilitation. Dr. Yang, the floor is all yours. My name is Yang Yi, and I am from the Department of Neurosurgery of Beijing Tiantai Hospital. And uh, uh, the topic I share today is biomarker stimulation for disorder of consciousness. Disorder of consciousness, short for DOC, and developed from acute coma, generally sustained more than 28 days. With advanced in the neurocritical care, the number of DOC patients is can continuously growing as more patients with injury survivors. This person this present big pressure and a challenge to the clinical treatment. DOC include a vegetative state, short for DS, and a minimally conscious state, short for MCS. So VS is a condition of visible unconsciousness, whereas the MCS is characterized by minimal but definite behavioral elements of several uh, awareness or environmental awareness. Therefore, our main target of surgical uh, adaptation is patients with MCS. So SCS is a, a surgical technical that has been classical use for pain and uh, classicity in management. According to the uh, literature, research group has applied this technical in DOC patients from 1989, and the lecture is usually implanted in the midline of the posterior abdominal space of the spinal cord during C2 to C4. And uh, the mechanism of SCS for DOC treatment is still unknown. SCS might include referring to the uh, cerebral cortex by a direct effect on the reticular formation. SCS promotes neuroplasticities in the central neural systems and uh, activities the uh, uh, residual function cortical areas. It also increases the cerebral blood perfusion. To better understand the effect of SCS, we have done the following series of uh, uh, studies and uh, the results and the conclusions are based on our these articles. So the first, we did a long-term follow-up to see the effect of spinal cord stimulation over a 10 years period. In this study, we summarized and uh, um, analy uh, analyzed the long-term effect of and the um, related uh, factors of SDS in patients with DOC. An overall positive outcomes was reached in uh, 55 of 110 patients. It's about 31.8%. Uh, uh, Among patients with uh, positive out outcomes, the MCS group included about 55.5% uh, more than the VS group. Uh, Normal growth based on age and the state of consciousness and the uh, pathogenic showed good um, predictive performance. So we can know SCS is one of the most uh, feasible treatments for patients with DOC, especially for the patients with MCS. And the younger age is associated with better outcomes and uh, it could uh, therefore serve as a basis for uh, pro-operative screenings. So after doing a study of uh, all of our treatment effect, we studied the influence of the details in the operations. A uh, total of 137 patients received active treatment in our teams. Among them, 27 patients were found with lecture deviation. Among them, uh, 12 patients were classified into the more deviation group. We found that electrode deviation uh, significantly 
relation to the central lateral side in the um, lateral positions. In uh, the um, maximum uh, tolerate simulator intensity in the less duration uh, duration group um, was higher than that in the more duration group. The patients is in the less duration group had higher post operative CRSR scores, and with the uh, uh, prolonged post operative time, the CRS scores improved faster in patients with less deviations. So based on the above research, we know that deviation of the electro from the midline of the spinal cord affect the outcomes. We so select uh, 69 patients with DOC and uh, adglow access. The delivery between C2 to 3 in the final 16 patients was exposed during the operations. The rate of completed uh, midline, 16, in midline uh, coverage by the electrodes in the 16 patients in the C2 to 3 delivery in exposure growth was higher than that of the 53 percent in the uh, conventional group. So the novel technical with uh, ex exposure of the dual between C2 to 3 and um, um, appropriate uh, um, electrical implantation size is safe and uh, can ensure electrical the array completely Cover the midlines. So, and then we um, tried a new kind of um, electrode for the uh, DOC patients. We report a piece of DOC patients receiving shortened SDS, short for STFDS treatment. Uh, in this operation, the electrode looks like a needle, and the way of operation is um, thrown. Uh, punctures. This is a um, uh, uh, 35 years old males and uh, uh, with the uh, service, the traumatic brain injuries remained common for about uh, three months. The patient was heavily uh, um, uh, evaluated using CISR scores and shows no improvement with one month. Received the STSS surveys and uh, reviewed the communications according to uh, instructions on days about 21 after surveys and include from RVS to uh, uh, emerge from MCS. So, through our pro uh, province uh, function FMI model, we can see that his green network has improved uh, significantly before and after the surgery. The uh, topography map also shows before and after SDSS treatment the, in the peak change in the frontal, central, uh, pectoral, and uh, uh, occipital. The connecting, uh, connected piece change before and after the treatment. Uh, after um, the, the keys, we then started our overall in effect of the shortened SS. This study focused on the CT and the effect of ST, SS for DOC and the reveals the modulation the correct directives. The uh, 31 patients received about two weeks ST SS treatment and the three months follow up. All the patients was divided into two types of food frequency treatment group uh, of 5 hertz and uh, 50 hertz according to the post-operative EG test. The result shows, the, uh, shows a significant increase in CRSR scores after the treatment. And furthermore, 5 hertz mainly shows an uh, increase in CRSR scores at about two weeks of treatment, but the 70 hertz Additionally, shows a delayed awake later the treatment. 
So on the basis of the previous studies, we compared the effect of different ICS on patients of DOC. A total of 60, 66 DOC patients um, include in these studies. We found that more DOC patients had um, the uh, elevated the elevated SC, uh, CS, CSF protein protein level among this receiving SCS uh, treatment with uh, uh, parental electrodes than the um, percutan nurse puncture selector electrode. So the uh, elevated SF um, protein levels are significantly associated with a uh, reduced uh, uh, sagittal diameters. The results suggest that the reducing uh, reducing the effect of electrical pads on um, anatomical change may have improved the outcome of DOC patients receiving SS treatment. So the uh, CSF protein levels are associated with a uh, poor post-operative outcomes. So uh, also uh, there's a, a series of uh, clinical studies has improved as that is um, uh, effective for the DOC, but is mechanism still unclear. So in these studies, we um, we uh, we uh, we recruited about a forty ten uh, for fourteen patients with DOC, including seven patients in MCS and seven patients in VS. All the patients receive a single section of two minutes, two minutes uh, continuous SCS stimulations. We record the rest state EEG before, during, and after SCS. In this study, the PEN was first calculated to describe the overall Activity is changed in the SCS. So we can see the PEN of all patients after the SCS was higher than before the SCS. And the change of the PEN uh, for MCS were more significantly than those for the VS, especially in the frontal regions. And then we do another study and we recorded the rest of the EVs from 16 people with MCS before and after SCS uh, operative and uh, um, investigated the mechanism of the uh, SCS on the neural dynamic, um, dynamic, dynamics in MCS patients. We find that the channel with GDFAE find widely of SCS and the phenomenon does the uh, phenomenon uh, may indicate that more cortical errors will engage in the information and in aggressions after SCS. In addition, the GDFAE value increases significantly in the frontal area and at a third speed and alpha. Band after SCS, our result indicates that information uh, integrations become more um, complex after the SCS. So, and then we do another studies the function connection uh, connectedness of the uh, phase log values, short for PLV, in the gamma band uh, is about 30 to the five horse was uh, uh, investigated at the pro on and post SCS stage. When the SCS was turned on, significantly decreased the activities was noted in the local skies of the frontal frontal region and in the large scans of the frontal parietal and the frontal um, occipital ranges. The global network showed uh, small world uh, 
properties. Um, average price less increased and the clusters uh, consistent decreased. The funding directly shows the SS could effectively intervene the cortical gamma activity and the uh, intervention include um, inducing um, global effort and the long lost local effort. So uh, we also want to know, want to find out which frequency is helpful for the SS for the DOC patients. Uh, so in these studies, we use the uh, resistance disease um, to record before and immediately after the access using a various frequency such as 5, uh, 12, 15, uh, 70s, and 100 11 patients in MCS. We found that significantly uh, aligned uh, a relative powers with uh, the um sign uh the uh, spec uh, was found in third and gamma band after one access stimulation using five seven and uh, one hundred hertz. Um because shows that uh, the coupling within that was a significant uh, decrease after the stimulation using 17 hertz. Well, we do reductions of uh, uh, coupling between dirt and gamma was found when using the 5 and 100 hertz. So maybe uh, 17 hertz is useful for the treatment. So in addition to the use of VEG, we also use another technical uh, function nurse. In these studies, we use function nurse to um, measure the, the, the dynamic hemodynamic response of 10 uh, disorder of consciousness patients to different uh, SDS frequency. Uh, it's the same as uh, the last uh, surface. If you use 5, 10, 15, 7, and uh, 100 Hz. In the uh, prefrontal context, a key area of the consciousness uh, is acute. We found significant increased hemodynamic response at 17 Hz and 100 Hz. Is significantly different uh, hemodynamic response between uh, 50 hertz and uh, um, 17 hertz. In addition, um, the function connectivities between um, prefrontal and uh, uh, occipital areas are improved with SS at 7 hertz. So the result is just the uh, uh, same with uh, EG. And uh, to um, optimize, uh, optimize the protocol, um, province studies uh, and evaluate the from from the special phase effort of SS on neurophysiological activities. However, whether and how the inter um, similar uh, interval, short for ISI. Uh, parameter effect of SS neuromodulation in DOC remains unknown. We enrolled nine DOC patients and uh, effective three different uh, durations of ISI using function nurse, just like the last studies. And we um, um, monitored the blood uh, volumes from uh, curations in the uh, prefrontal and uh, uh, occipital uh, codex uh, during the ICS. The result shows that the shot stimulate uh, just uh, 30 seconds include a uh, significant flow value change, especially in the prefrontal context. That is the, study, the first studies for the uh, interstimular 
intervals for the SCS. And uh, here are two examples, two keys for the spinal cord stimulations for the patient with uh, disorders of consciousness. And the first patient we can see that uh, is uh, uh, cognitive and uh, mobile communication functions that has improved. And we can see the communication with other patients. And uh, the second case, we can uh, see that with the um, motor functions has been great improvement. So um, all about is our uh, preliminary the studies of DO citations treat as SCS. Uh, however, more um, uh, evidence based uh, on the uh, randomized controlled trials are uh, needed to confirm the effect of the treatment. So we hope there are more um, experts who are interested in this field and draw us our and uh, with this process and uh, improve this technique uh, together. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Young. Despite uh, the technical problems, it was a fascinating talk. I have some questions uh, for you, if I may. Do you have any experience with other types of stimulation or only with tonic stimulation? Have you tried other waveforms? Oh, uh, I know. Then for the SCS stimulation, there are the um, conventional stimulation and the uh, tonic stimulation. And in the SCS treatment for the DOC patients, we uh, usually use the uh, uh, conventional, uh, conventional uh, stimulate. And we, uh, that is only the, uh, the tonic stimulation. We try to uh, use some high uh, frequency um, stimulation or the burst stimulations, but uh, it's not a um, factor for the uh, consciousness improved. It may be used uh, useful for the for the pain or for the uh, the the motor function improved. So then um, we will um, we will study. Or, or do some research for the um, disorders patients, other functions using the uh, different type of stimulation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is a question online here. The colleague is saying, thanks, Dr. Yang. What is your ideal patient to do this procedure? And if is it for patients with actual injury as well? It is for the patient with uh, oh oh okay I mm, that's a good question. Mm. There are two questions. The first one: mm. uh, which would be the best candidate for spinal cord stimulation for uh, this indication? Uh, for the DO three patients, uh, it's a uh, uh, a lot of times. So mm, uh, mm, we just think the. Uh, patients with uh, brain uh, injuries uh, from trauma, that is uh, maybe the uh, have the good uh, outcomes from the SCS treatment. And uh, uh, if the patients with uh, uh, oxygen injuries, that uh, um, that may be not a, uh, it's, it's just a, can do this. SS treatment, but uh, um, we, we could not say that there are uh, good. Uh, uh, and uh, what do you think uh, about patients with diffuse axonal injury? Could they benefit from this modality? Um, yeah, uh, these people can um, be benefit from this um, treatment, but. Uh, we could not uh, mm, say there are uh, very good outcomes. We just uh, uh, need to do some 
uh, evaluate before the operation. Okay, thank you. I don't have any other questions. I don't know if uh, the colleagues who are online would like to ask something, Dr. Yang. Otherwise, we can uh, go back to Raya. Yeah, I think there are no further questions and so we'll wind this up. <coughs> also, we have Professor Samuel Brown joining in. Welcome, Professor. So I would like to thank Professor Georgios Matis and Dr. Yi Yang for their wonderful session about spinal cord stimulation. I have update from Professor Shubin and as of now we have around 750 people who have joined us live on YouTube, WeChat and Zoom. So we'll move on to the second session and I would like to hand over this online podium to our honorable chair, Professor Nobuhito Morota, who will say a short introduction and invite us Broad for his lecture. Oh, it's midnight in Japan, but good morning, Professor Broad. Morning. Okay. The resotomy is now emerging uh, more and more, and uh, in the child nervous system, more paper has been submitted in the last several years. Uh, so the, my understanding is that people are now going back to resotomy together with uh, backlog and treatment for spasticity. And uh, most of the people have some question about what's the advantage of risotomy and uh, compare with the backlog hand treatment. And uh, even the risotomy, we have many, uh, you know, if you want to uh, publish a, a kind of guidance, it's very difficult. The patient, what's the indication of the surgery? What's the best selection of the patient? What's the best surgical procedure? Uh, like probably you do the one segment uh, medullary, exposing the corneus medullaris and do the risotomy, but the standard procedure for the cardiogene or the professor sent you in, in French, he performed his own procedure. So the procedure itself is somehow not unified. <laughs> There's many variations. Yes. And uh, I hope you can make uh, some good explanation and uh, demonstrate your procedure and your way or how you think about the isotomy and its future. Especially my question is uh, how you decide how much of the nerve root or rootlet you cut in mm -hmm. each patient. How do you decide it? You decide it during the surgery or you have some idea before surgery how much of you you had the route. I'm accepting uh your issue. Thank you very yeah, much. <laughs> Please go Professor, I, I look I look forward to explaining that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, it, it's an absolute honor to uh, be asked to uh, present to this group. Uh, it's uh, been a great uh, uh, part of my my career, uh, you know, being able to come uh, and, and and see friends uh, who are, are colleagues uh, who are interested in this procedure. And I'll talk a little bit at the end. We've had a chance to share some of these learnings with. Mm -hmm. colleagues in Shanghai and in Australia uh, as we've uh, taken the amazing work of Dr. Uh, Park and made some uh, modifications over the years how we do the uh, procedure. So just by introduction, since I haven't had the opportunity to speak to this group previously, uh, I'm S Sam Brown. I'm a professor of neurosurgery at the University of Washington in uh, Seattle. I practice exclusively at Seattle Children's Hospital. Um, I have a variety of different roles at the hospital and at the university. I run the Sports Institute, uh, concussion program, hydrocephalus program, but also importantly for today, uh, direct the uh, surgical tone management uh, program at Seattle Children's uh, Hospital. And like everybody else, I'm on on Twitter if it if it remains an entity uh, going forward. So uh, love to have folks follow. There's no disclosures for me today, so I'm going to just walk through briefly what the objectives are uh, for the talk. We want to define briefly what movement disorder terminology is, including dystonia and spasticity, uh, and that relates to patient selection uh, in our practice. 
uh, explain how the selective dorsal rhizotomy treats spasticity, outline uh, the evaluation process at Seattle uh, Children's and how we uh, select the patients to move forward. I'll explain how I do the operation uh, and how <clears throat> neuromonitoring is such a critical aspect of what we do in this case. We'll outline the typical post-operative course and rehabilitation following rhizotomy, which is, again, a, a critical portion of uh, good success for the procedure. And then we'll describe the outcomes uh, uh, and uh, show some uh, examples of uh, some of the patients. And then at the end, I'll touch briefly on uh, selective ventral and dorsal rhizotomy. So we've started to do more of these procedures where uh, we're cutting both the ventral and dorsal nerves uh, uh, as a, a palliative treatment for very severely impacted uh, kids. So to get started, movement disorder uh, terminology. So tone is a resistance of passive movement and hypertonicity is an abnormally increased resistance uh, to an externally imposed uh, movement or force. And this categories that we talk about are dystonia, rigidity, and spasticity. And hyperkinetic movements or any unwanted excess movement, athetosis, chorea, and dystonia falls into that category as well. In this video, you can see a classic example of spasticity. These are velocity-dependent uh, movements. You can feel the catch as you're moving the patient's arm or leg. This is caused by a disruption of the uh, upper motor neuron uh, pathways as they descend uh, down to the spinal cord. And you can see this in uh, cerebral palsy uh, and a variety of other uh, disorders uh, of the, uh, the brain and nervous system. Uh, and again, the severity of the movement uh, depends upon where that damage is. So again, for this particular procedure, we're largely talking about kids uh, who have uh, cerebral palsy. Now, in our practice, we'll see a variety of different patterns of spasticity. While diplegia is the most common type of spasticity uh, that we uh, leverage selective dorsal rhizotomy, uh, you can uh, effectively do it on patients with uh, monoplegia, hemiplegia. Uh, it is largely intended for the lower extremities, but there have been very uh, good proof in the literature that there's some slight improvement in tone in the upper extremity too, and happy to discuss that in the question and answer section. Dystonia is an important thing to make a differentiation on your examination, and these are really sustained intermittent muscle contractions. Uh, you can have this involving any aspect of, of the body, and we often see neck and uh, facial uh, involvement uh, this is largely uh, from uh, cortical basal ganglia uh, loops. And this type of movement disorder is not uh, uh, responsive to selective dorsal rhizotomy. And so if a patient has a predominance of dystonia, uh, then we will not offer SDR. So as we evaluate the kids at our hospital in Seattle, uh, this is a, a multidisciplinary approach. Our uh, rehabilitation uh, uh, colleagues will uh, help in the initial assessment of the kids. We utilize the GMF CS scale. This is looking at uh, the ability of uh, the child to do uh, various activities, and it goes from level one all the way through uh, level five as uh, illustrated in this, in this diagram. Again, for selective dorsal rhizotomy, we're typically operating on kids who are levels one through three. The ventral dorsal rhizotomies in our practice has typically been in those classified as level five. Um, so at the beginning, uh, there was question certainly about uh, pumps versus uh, rhizotomy. So in the global uh, tone management or how we can treat these patients, we have a variety of tools at our, our disposal. And often in our practice, the kids will initially have cycled through a variety of uh, things, including medication, potentially Botox or phenol injections. And 
they often come uh, for consideration of baclofen pump placement. Baclofen pumps are effective therapies, but they require a significant amount of maintenance. They have uh, uh, known complications, obviously, associated with them. And the thing that I like about rhizotomy and properly selected children is that it's a one and done procedure with long lasting benefits. So you don't have to come back in and get refills on the pump. You don't have to have the pump replaced every six years as the battery wears out. Rhizotomy is a very effective procedure for uh, properly selected kids and it frees them from needing a surgical implant that requires maintenance. So what is a selective dorsal rhizotomy? So as we break down the term, in the way that this procedure is done now, it's very individualized to a patient. So when we say selective, we're going to cut specific nerves that we know are going to target muscles that have abnormal tone and reactivity. And so in the operating room, every single child is completely different. There are themes, obviously, as we're operating, but how each child is wired relative to the injury that they sustained is very different. It's quite, quite fascinating, actually. So selectivity uh, in the name of the procedures that we're, we're being very selective uh, and personalizing the operation to that child and what their needs are. Dorsal, as I referred to earlier, refers to the dorsal uh, uh, nerves and rhizotomy is obviously uh, cutting of the nerve. So I always get asked the question, how does this actually treat spasticity? Well, you know, if you look back at the stretch reflex and the inhibition that normally is maintaining that reflex from, uh, uh, from the brain, it's uh, impacted uh, by loss of inhibition. And so what we do is we actually just go in with the operation and we disrupt this reflex loop by cutting a portion of the sensory nerves. This reduces the tone in, in the muscle and resets uh, uh, the degree of, of, of tone for that child. And so it's really a, I think of it as a wiring problem and we're cutting some of the wires that are that are coming through. So I mentioned our, we have a particular philosophy how we uh, manage and offer selective dorsal rhizotomy at Seattle Children's. And again, this, I talk about it as a team sport. So my colleagues in rehabilitation, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and obviously us in neurosurgery all work together in the evaluation and determination of which child is a good candidate to have selective dorsal rhizotomy. So these kids will come in and they will get a very uh, extensive evaluation. Everybody will get an MRI of the brain. We're uh, looking for any unusual pathology that may come up. The majority of the kids will have periventricular leukomalacia uh, related to their cerebral palsy. Uh, we're looking to make sure as we do the physical exam and work with uh, our physical therapy colleagues that they have adequate strength in their lower extremities and reasonable range of motion. As I've mentioned several times, we are looking for spasticity as the predominant movement disorder. While they can have dystonia, if dystonia is the predominant feature, we do not offer SDR, and those kids will go on to get a baclofen pump most typically. Uh, motor control is something that we assess uh, with the kids, and we also wanna make sure that they're good candidates for rehabilitation. So the way I think of a selective dorsal rhizotomy is that we are creating by lesioning, by cutting the nerves, the potential for neuroplasticity to occur. So what these kids are doing over six months to a year rehabilitation is they're rewiring their brain spinal cord uh, connection as we teach them better movement patterns because we've eliminated that abnormal uh, tone that they have. So this is really what's going on in the, the background. And we tend to not think of the procedure like that, but in essence, that's that's what we're doing. So we wanna make sure these kids are really good candidates for rehabilitation because it's quite intensive. And we wanna make sure that they're committed uh, to do that. The typical age range uh, that we operate is between three and eight years old. Having said that, we've done this procedure in adults with great effect. And I will often operate on teenagers if they're delayed to presentation. And again, the GMFCS score for the kids we're operating on for SDRs uh, uh, between one and three. 
So in this initial evaluation, we're going to do a general examination, a detailed musculoskeletal evaluation, obviously neurologic exam. And then we're going to go through and look very specifically at uh, tone. We do video-based gait assessment. We're also looking at motor control. And then uh, part of the team approach here, again, is looking at everything that's surrounding that. And a lot of kids will have uh, AFOs or orthotics bracing. So we want to understand you know, what, what is the specific need of that child. And there are a variety of scores and scales that we use both pre and post operatively to look at the kids and their, their outcomes. Many of these are listed here. Uh, the bad scale, for example, is a scale of dystonia. And so we're using these various scales and outcome measures to assess and then follow the children. So the benefits of rhizotomy, I alluded to this earlier. The reason I like this is it's a single surgery. You have three hours of surgery and you're done. It's in our world of neurosurgery, a very low risk procedure. It reduces or mostly eliminates spasticity in properly selected kids. And the hope here is that we see these kids early enough and operate on them early enough that we hopefully prevent the need for significant orthopedic surgeries in the future. And many of the kids we operate on do end up needing orthopedic procedures, but a lot of that depends again on the timing of when we intervene. So the risks of selective dorsal rhizotomy, many families are concerned that it's irreversible. That is true, you're cutting the nerves. However, with plasticity and their ability to recover, uh, the kids do very well. It does not treat dystonia again. In general, my party line to families when I talk to them is that it's not intended at all for the arms but they may see a little bit of benefit uh, in that. And it's variable depending upon the patients. But there's again, literature that suggests that even with the lumbar rhizotomy, there can be some improvement in upper extremity tone. There's always an initial decline in function because many of the kids rely on their tone for mobility. And so you take away uh, the spasticity and you expose this underlying weakness that's there. And that's the role of physical therapy afterwards is to build back that strength. So many of the kids come in ambulating with a, a walk or some other assistive device and may need a wheelchair for some period of time after surgery as they gain back that strength. So we counsel the families extensively about that and all the kids do gain back uh, that strength. Usually immediately, sometimes it's several weeks and a few, it even takes a few months for that to improve. I've mentioned this multiple times, but intensive post-operative rehabilitation is key. And the surgical risks are standard risks. Uh, infection, spinal fluid leak is uh, very uh, low risk. Bowel bladder dysfunction. On occasion, we will have kids who have urinary retention after the surgery, and we monitor uh, with a urethral catheter uh, function during the operation. Historically, People didn't like SDR because there was a higher risk of spinal instability when you were doing multi-level laminectomies. With a single-level laminectomy that I'll show you in a moment, the risk of spinal instability is significantly decreased in the long term. In dysesthetic pain or neuropathic pain after the procedure, in my experience, is exceedingly low. One of the things that we do in the operation is when we cut the nerves, if there's any bleeding at all, we just leave it alone or put gel foam on it. I never buzz the nerves. And I think that helps prevent formation of neuromas or other issues. So it's very rare in this procedure to have uh, uh, pain, nerve pain after the operation. So this is getting into how we actually do the operation. So it's obviously a, a general anesthetic, the patient's prone. We've been working with our neuromonitoring team now for well over a decade with this particular procedure, and they're very skilled at uh, helping. And again, they're part of the team in the operating room. It's a strange operation from the standpoint that we're collaborating and discussing what to do, what nerves to cut between myself, the rehab doctor, and the electrophysiologist during the case. So we'll typically uh, use fluoroscopy. I tend to do this operation right below the level of the conus. I think it's easier to do and certainly easier to teach to our fellows and trainees. 
So and we're typically going to take off uh, L, the back of L2. The laminectomy will be at that level. But we'll look at the MRI that's obtained and confirm the level of the conus. And then we go one level below that typically for the operation. The interoperative monitoring, I've mentioned, obviously very critical. We replace subdermal electrodes. Uh, various muscles are monitored uh, uh, during the case. Adductors, vastus uh, medialis, anterior tib, gastrox, biceps femoris, uh, perirectal uh, uh, leads are placed, and also a urethral catheter. So we can cover the uh, spectrum of the uh, uh, exiting uh, lumbar and sacral uh, nerves. You can see uh, quite extensive uh, monitoring, and then the patient is positioned as, as shown here. So the surgical approach, once we uh, do the laminectomy and we open up the dura, and I'll show you a video in just a moment, what we start out doing is confirming what is in fact a dorsal or what is a ventral nerve because we're going to go through and test the entire cauda equina in the way that I do this procedure. And so the dorsal nerves and ventral nerves typically have about a 10x different in stimulation uh, uh, current that uh, activates that nerve. So less uh, stimulation on ventral nerves, more stimulation is necessary for dorsal. So we established what that, that threshold is. Then what we do is we place this blue silastic band around the entire cauda equina, and we secure it to the dura on one side. And that way we can keep track of which nerves are cut or tested or which ones are preserved. And we just go one by one through the nerves doing the testing. So again, uh, we want to separate normal from abnormal on our scoring system. And uh, Professor asked the uh, question just a little while ago about how do I determine how much to cut? So I have a general rule of thumb here that if the, nor the nerve is normal, we just leave it, especially if it's not going to an affected muscle group. We just tuck that nerve away. If it is going to a target muscle, and it reacts abnormally. So we'll talk about what that means, recruitment, going to the other side. Then we'll cut typically at least 75% of that nerve. If it is going to a target muscle, but it reacts normally, I'll still cut about 50% of the nerve. And one thing you'll see when I do the operation, a lot of people will tease uh, these nerve rootlets into tiny little fascicles and then test them. I tend to keep them in a relatively uh, preserved state because as you start to pull and stretch the nerves, the uh, testing becomes abnormal or changed in many ways. And so I've found over the years that I can cut in different portions of the nerve and ob obtain the same result without um, stretching the nerves. So again, when we're doing the uh, selection criteria, we're looking for either normal or uh, abnormal response. This is normal as a single response to resp uh, repetitive uh, stimulation. And we're doing both a singular and a tetonic uh, stimulation uh, or what we refer to as a, a train. And in these abnormal responses, we'll see incremental amplitude uh, patterns, uh, motor responses in non-targeted uh, muscles. So they'll be spread, spread to adjacent muscles or sometimes spread even to the opposite side of, of the body. And the responses can be abnormal and sustained. And so that would be considered an abnormal route when we see that. So I'm gonna walk through for a moment here, the surgical uh, video of the uh, procedure. So once the laminectomy is uh, done, we'll, uh, under the microscope, open the dura, use four neural lines and uh, tack the uh, dura back. Uh, what you're looking at here is we pulled the cauda equina to the side and we feed this blue band around uh, all of the nerve roots. And then we redundantly secure that uh, across from uh, the uh, uh, primary surgeon. Then what we'll do is we will go through and we will stimulate uh, the nerves and ones that preserve get tucked behind uh, the membrane and those that we find abnormal will go through and cut. And if you look at the way I'm doing it here, this is different than I think some others uh, do this. Instead of teasing this into multiple different um, uh, fascicles of the nerve, 
I will cut it in different quadrants uh, to obtain the, either that 50 or 75 percent amount of uh, transection of the nerve. And then once we're done with that, we simply tuck it behind that, that membrane. And so again, here you see me just sampling different aspects of the nerve as we cut through it to obtain uh, uh, the overall uh, percentage uh, goal. The other thing you'll see here is that I don't buzz or bipolar the nerves, even when there's little tiny arteries or veins that, that are there, we will just leave that and either place some gel foam or typically it'll just stop with some irrigation. And so typically it takes us about an hour to open up and be ready to do the surgery. It takes about an hour to test and uh, cut the nerves. And then it takes about an hour to close. So what's demonstrated here is we're typically at the level of L2 and the L2 exiting nerve root is usually above the field. So at the end of the case, what we'll do is we will angle the scope up, visually find the exiting L2 nerve root, and then we'll separate it. It usually has three main fascicles. The upper two are the dorsal nerves and the lower one is ventral. And then we'll do the same thing. We'll test and cut uh, accordingly. At the end here, we uh, place some gel foam that typically clears the field. We irrigate, and then we just close the dura with a running uh, uh, for a neuron. I don't do anything to replace the lamina, and we just close the uh, muscle and skin up from, from that point. So post-operatively, uh, we keep the kids flat for uh, three days. Uh, we think that helps uh, reduce the risk of spinal fluid leak. Uh, although now in a lot of our intradural work, we're letting the kids get up the next day, but we're still keeping them down for three days afterwards. Routine pain management. Again, rarely any nerve dysesthetic uh, uh, pain that would um, uh, require medication. Uh, optimizing their nutrition. Constipation for these kids is always an issue. And so managing that post-op is uh, important. And then we begin the initial uh, rehabilitation uh, uh, consultation to then transfer them uh, after three days. We have a different model than a lot of places in the United States where we have the patient stay inpatient for three weeks, up to three weeks after the operation and do aggressive physical therapy and occupational therapy several times a day. So it's a big commitment for the family to come in because we will want them to stay and get the uh, rehabilitation kick-started. But then when they leave the hospital, they'll still have to go for physical therapy uh, at least three times a week. And that continues for six months to a year and even beyond for some of the kids. So it's, again, a big commitment, and we want to make sure before we operate that families are, are ready to do this. So the outcomes are excellent. This is my favorite operation uh, in pediatric neurosurgery to do because the kids do so well and the families are so happy. It's incredibly life-changing for them. Uh, it's proven in the literature, it reduces, um, certainly in our practice, it, it reduces spasticity. It improves the range of motion. Uh, there's functional improvement uh, for these kids, and I can talk a little bit about some of that because a lot of it's not uh, well documented in the literature that these kids, uh, they have better social engagement because they're not falling into their friends. They're able to now use the toilet independently because they can manage their bodies. They tend to end up doing better in school because they're less focused on trying to just control their body and they can pay attention to their schoolwork. So we see a lot of these very interesting um, uh, anecdotal things that uh, come up, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Now, I mentioned before that some of the kids still go on to need orthopedic uh, surgery. Uh, certainly, a lot of that depends on what age they come to us. If they've already got contractures or other issues, uh, uh, then those will be addressed. And we usually want to do the tone management before we do these orthopedic procedures, so we make sure that they're durable and long-lasting. Functional gains in literature have been shown to go out uh, uh, for many, many uh, years. It clearly improves gait kinematics, and I'll show you some examples in a moment. In my hands, and I think most folks who do this, is a very low-risk uh, operation overall. And in our practice in Seattle, I've trained now uh, 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 over 15 fellows who've now gone out and established their own practices and other 
colleagues around the world uh, to do this procedure. It's a, a great, great operation. And as I mentioned, the parents love this. It changes their life and their kid's life. And there's very high caregiver and patient satisfaction from this type of procedure. So I'll show a couple of examples quickly here. On the left is the preoperative state. The kid's using a walker. You can see as a uh, gate where he's uh, walking on his toes. He has a uh, crossing that's going on. We did the rhizotomy on him and four years after the operation, we tend to follow these kids now closely for a long period of time. You can see him ambulating uh, with just uh, 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 crutches. His gait is significantly improved. And one of the things that we hear often from the families is their stamina and endurance is significantly improved. So these kids can walk for much uh, longer, farther uh, distances. They're much more able to uh, interact and engage because, uh, you know, they're quite frankly expending a lot less energy. So that's one example of a patient of ours. Here's another uh, child, this is just three months after the operation. So again, this this child's able to ambulate uh, independently, but you can see again um, the significant amount of uh, tone that he has, uh, toe walking that's going on, just the com complexity of his uh, gait pattern. This is three months after surgery on the right. You can see that his uh, gait is significantly improved. His efficiency of gait is markedly improved, how flat he is in terms of his uh, uh, feet and heel strike uh, on the floor. All of these things are significantly better. And that's just three months after operation in, in this, this little boy. So again, I mentioned the families love this operation. Uh, you know, we get quotes and we tend to follow up with the patients very closely and try and understand not just what's reported in the literature around improvements in tone. While that's important for us as a, a clinician scientists to be able to follow the outcomes, what's much more meaningful are, you know, again, how, how do the families think the procedure went and how is that child doing overall and in just their quality of life. And we see, you know, amazing quotes uh, like this, and this is the routine after this operation. So I'm gonna pivot in the last couple of minutes and talk uh, about how we've been interested in expanding this procedure uh, beyond the traditional GMFCS uh, one, two, and three kids and use it in, in, in folks who uh, have very severe CP. So in this setting, selective ventral dorsal rhizotomy, where we're cutting uh, both uh, 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 types of nerves, is really intended uh, as a palliative uh, measure. Some of these folks have such profound tone that they're in pain. The families are not able to really provide uh, good care around like the perineal area, for example. And what we've seen with this procedure is that it significantly decreases spasticity increases range of motion. Again, for the majority of the families, there's a high degree of uh, satisfaction with this. The Part of the reason I got interested in this is that in Seattle, our patient catchment is enormous. So we have patients coming from Alaska, which is a four and a half hour uh, flight away, Idaho, Montana. So we have patients that are hundreds, if not thousands of miles away from us. And so implanting a baclofen pump can be problematic if they uh, have a pump failure and often getting refills and things like that can be challenging, just given the geographic location. So we got quite interested in could we use the ventral dorsal rhizotomy to reduce the tone in these patients that we know are not going to be ambulating. So that issue is sort of taken off of the table. So the difference here, again, is this is done for palliative purposes. It treats both spasticity and dystonia because we're cutting a very significant portion of the nerve. So typically when I'm doing this operation and others now that are doing this around the country, including uh, our colleagues at uh, Gillette um, uh, Children's Hospital, we're cutting about 90% of the ventral nerves. And we still cut about 75% of the dorsal uh, nerves. So we'll go through and 
do the testing as I illustrated to you uh, earlier. Uh, but here, in this case, the ventral nerves are going to get uh, sectioned significantly, and that allows the um, dystonia, which is very common in the G GMFCS level five kids, to be reduced because we're taking away both the in in uh, 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 input and, and output signal. And we don't uh, have these kids go through rehabilitation afterwards. This is a singular, again, three-hour surgery to do this. And after recovery, they just go home. So there is starting to be some literature emerging around this. Um, and it has uh, demonstrated that there are good results uh, from this. Our experience has been generally positive. I think the one negative around this is that there is about a 5% risk of permanent urinary retention doing this. So extensively counsel the families that they may end up having to do intermittent catheterization. And for many of them, that's an, a, a reasonable trade-off given the significant degree of spasticity and dystonia and inability to care for these kids and also the degree of pain that many of these kids are in from their tone. So I counsel them extensively about that. So there'll be more emerging literature on this, but I think this is actually a great procedure. It avoids the cost and complexity of a pump, and many families have uh, in our hands benefited from that operation. This is just an example of one kid that we treated. He was 10 years old, quadruparetic CP, GMFCS uh, level five. He had hydrancephaly. Uh, uh, the family's goals were very simple. They wanted to more easily care for him. They wanted him more comfortable and to reduce his pain. They, we didn't do a pump in him. We generally won't place pumps in patients that have hydrancephaly. We find that they get overdosed uh, quite easily. And so he went on to have a ventral dorsal rhizotomy. One of the interesting things I'll call out here is the BAD scale is used to assess dystonia and preoperatively uh, versus postoperatively, his dystonia scale uh, uh, dropped significantly. And what we found in this child was he was able to uh, be in a, a sitting position uh, without pain. It was significantly easier for the family to move him. Uh, this is an example of this child. As you look at this preoperative video, he has very profound, profound tone and dystonia. Uh, he crosses his legs. It's very hard for them to even move his legs apart to provide uh, adequate uh, care for him. And he rarely sleeps and is in significant uh, uh, pain. Uh, and that's a routine uh, uh, thing for this child. And then postoperatively, unfortunately, we don't show it in this video, but he's significantly looser in his lower extremities. He's comfortably uh, positioned. Uh, they can provide adequate uh, care for him. And for this family, it was a significant win having the operation because you know the child did did well and the goals for them were accomplished. And we did this um, again because we didn't want to place a baclofen pump for this child. Uh, but if you can have a single operation like this and not need to have an implant with ongoing maintenance, I think there's a lot of benefits to that in appropriately selected patients. So this is just a composite of uh, a couple of kids that we've taken care of. Again, uh, for anybody around the world who gets to do this operation, you'll know that it's incredibly fun and rewarding. The families are amazing. You're taking these kids who are otherwise healthy and unable to really manage their bodies and giving them really a whole new lease on, on life and ability to engage and grow and interact and it's why we do neurosurgery, right? It's to really improve patients' lives. And this is a procedure that uh, allows that to happen uh, in incredible uh, ways. For those interested, we did publish our uh, style of uh, doing this uh, procedure in pediatric neurosurgery. Uh, this came out in 2016. And I'm always happy if folks are interested and want to learn the procedure, please uh, reach out. Um, I would uh, tell you that one of the more fun things I did recently is I have an amazing colleague uh, uh, who is in Adelaide, Australia, and she had reached out right before COVID, was planning to come to Seattle to uh, watch the procedure and see how we were doing it in Seattle. We unfortunately, with COVID, were not able to do that. So what we started to do was to do remote proctoring. 
And so she actually performed her first operation uh, streaming it live on MS Teams. And I was in my office in Seattle and we were just walking through the entire procedure together. So we ended up doing five or six operations where either she was broadcasting to me or vice versa, I was operating and sending her the images. This is an example of that case. She actually was on holiday and you can see a wallaby. I think that's a wallaby in the uh, background while she was watching uh, and, and uh, conversing around the rhizotomy. So we've had a great opportunity to teach uh, friends and colleagues uh, this uh, procedure and certainly happy if there's anyone who wants to learn it or refer patients, uh, here's our contact information. So absolute pleasure to be invited and uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Brough. Uh, the, there's two questions. The first question is, uh, thank you very much, uh, Brough, and can you please comment again on the selective dorsal rhizotomy, various uh, backup and pump? What is your strategy in choosing one over the other? And when do you say not to both? That, that's the first question. Yeah, no, happy to address that. So we offer both pumps and rhizotomies in our in our comprehensive look at tone management. Um, when we are looking at the kids, we're thinking about both options and, and trying to determine which is, is the better option for that child. So typically, selective dorsal rhizotomy, again, those are going to be the kids who are typically spastic diplegia, GMFCS one through three, they, <clears throat> excuse me, on evaluation have a lower degree of dystonia. So if dystonia is a predominant feature, they will get a baclofen pump. And usually that's with a high cervical placement, or I'm also doing interventricular baclofen uh, pump now where we're putting the catheter into the, uh, into the ventricle. So again, the dystonia is largely one of the driving factors. If there's a lot of dystonia, the rhizotomy is not the correct procedure for that kid. The other thing is also their ability to participate in rehabilitation. And so if they uh, are not able to commit to this type of aggressive rehab, then those kids may move on to get a pump instead because you know they generally would have to come in every you know three or four months for a refill. It's just a different level of commitment and engagement. So those are often two of the key factors that we're looking at as we're making a determination between a pump or a rhizotomy. Thank you. And the uh, next question is, uh, uh, when do you send a normal case with toe walking to testing? So this is an indication for the patient with very mild uh, spasticity with uh, toe walking. Do you send, uh, select him to, for the surgery or not? Yeah, you know, it's one feature of many that we look at in the assessment. So as I indicated in, in the talk, the assessment of these kids is actually quite extensive. So we want to understand why are they toe walking? Is it because they, you know, may ne just need a tendon lengthening and that's the only issue? If there's a significant degree of you know spasticity in those muscle groups and it's leading the toe walking, then those are the kids we're going to you know look at extensively and see if they're a, a, a candidate for uh, a rhizotomy. Toe walking alone in isolation without spasticity is not an indication for SDR. It's really geared toward the reduction of of the tone and so the toe walking is a consequence in those kids of of uh, uh, the specificity and high tone that they have yeah thank you very much uh, uh, i have some questions it's okay yeah pl yeah please, yeah. please. <laughs> in japan you know the you see uh, the orthopedic surgeon took care of the spastic patient for a long time in japan and the neurosurgery mm -hmm. started the surgery uh, after I came back to Japan in the, uh, nearly 30 years ago, I started the rhizotomy. So the, most of the patient had been cared by orthopedic surgeon. So still yes. now, orthopedic surgeon try to take care of the, or, or operate first. But in the United States, somehow the people are understanding that the uh, neurosurgical procedure, the reduction of spastic comes first. Is that right? 
Yeah, no, happy to talk about that. So, you know, one of the concerns with we, we tend to manage it in the states where the cerebral, the kids with cerebral palsy are often managed by either their primary care physician or rehabilitation. They will often see uh, orthopedic surgeons, but you know the long-term uh, outcome of orthopedic surgery, if you don't manage the tone, is not good. And that's been, I think, recognized largely in the states that if they do tendon lengthening, and they you know may be able to get that that kid who's toe walking to have a flatter uh, gait. If the spasticity is not dealt with, then those issues will recur, and then they'll end up reoperating multiple times on those kids. So part of the evaluation in partnership with orthopedic surgery in our practice, and I think in most places around the United States, is we generally want to address the tone up front so that if there are orthopedic procedures, they're done and they're durable and long lasting. Because if you don't address the tone, the same underlying physiologic uh, issues you know, come back and, and they end up needing these operations over, over and over again. There are some uh, you know, procedures that are being done with tendon lengthening um, to try and in theory address uh, tone, but in general in our practice, uh, tone management will come first. The orthopedic uh, doctors will refer the patients if they've seen them as the first entry point into the healthcare system, they will refer them uh, appropriately to neurosurgery for evaluation. And then after we operate a few weeks later, they often will come in and do the orthopedic procedure. One final thing is we have definitely done joint procedures in a couple of patients where we knew they needed some tendon lengthening to be able to accomplish the goals of rehabilitation. And so we did in those settings, a joint procedure where I would do the rhizotomy, and while the patient's still under the anesthetic, orthopedic surgery would come in and either do casting or they would do uh, tendon lengthening, and then those kids would go on to rehab. So we really do individualize it, but I, I agree with you. I think the orthopedic surgeons, it's very important for them to understand that the underlying tone is a real problem. And they may fix the problem for a short time with, with an orthopedic procedure, but it's not the right thing necessarily to do for the kids because their problems will just come back if the tone is not effectively managed. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, the situation in Japan is changing a good deal, but still there's some conflict. <laughs> oh, understand. <Okay>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next question is... Uh, some patient uh, say GMFCS uh, level one or level two. Some patient had only unilateral spasticity with hemiparesis and uh, unilateral spasticity. Do you operate such patient? And if you operate, you, you operate only the affected side or the contralateral side too. Yeah. So, yeah. So if, if there's hemispasticity uh, that's present, and again, the same general parameters apply here that it needs to be spasticity and not dystonia. So in those kids, you can still operate. The procedure is the same. Again, the beauty of the procedure is that you're testing all of the nerves. And so if it's, you know, involving just one side, you can find those nerves that are reacting abnormally and section those. And what's interesting is there can be some nerves that may cross one side uh, to the other. And again, if you find those, you can still section those, those nerves uh, effectively. <clears throat> those are uncommon patients, but uh, uh, definitely can benefit from a rhizotomy procedure. Okay, thank you. And my last question. Okay. Uh, regarding <laughs> surgical procedure about the that uh, section of the nerve root, uh, when I I see your video, you cut the nerve root of say uh, as you explained 50, 70 percent. If you judge the root is abnormal, in my practice I divide the root to several rootlets, four to six rootlets, and each rootlet I examine again and cut it or not cut. So if I cut two out of four rootlets, then it comes to the cutting rate 50%. One out of five rootlets, 
then it comes to the cutting rate twenty percent. But you don't divide the nerve into root, uh, nerve root to root rate. You just cut and then check the response of the muscle before you you see the this is a satisfactory fifty percent okay or you go to seventy five percent. You judge by the response after you cut something. Yeah, no, I under, I understand your question for sure. So when I trained, uh, I I trained with uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Jack Walker in Salt Lake City. So Jack uh, had learned the procedure from uh, Doctor Park in St. Louis, and they would tend to divide the nerves, as you're referring to, into smaller uh, rootlets. I did that initially in my practice and I found that, you know, there's a, a propensity to be able, when you do that, you're inherently stretching the nerve. And we found that some of the responses would, would change. And what I also realized uh, from work that had preceded me at, uh, at Seattle Children's, uh, one of the uh, neurosurgeons uh, had been doing rhizotomies and would only cut about 25% of the nerves in those operations. And when they looked at the long-term outcome, those kids did not have as good a result in reduction of tone. And in fact, the reduction of tone was no better than physical therapy alone. So there were a combination of factors that led me to do this. One is efficiency of the operation. I don't think it's necessary to divide it up. Two, I think if you divide them up, you're inherently stretching uh, the nerves and the signals can change. And that may impact like how you are treating that kid, right? Because you may test that one nerve and you may not see a response. And it may not be that that, nerve's, uh, that nerve is abnormal. It's that you stretch the nerve and it's not working properly. So I found that to be the case uh, at times when I was operating. And so what I do is I try to preserve those nerves, manipulate them very little to try and get a very pure electrophysiology response. And then if I know that it's abnormal, and again, going to a targeted muscle, then I'm gonna cut about 75%. And, and instead of having individual you know, uh, uh, fascicles, I just randomly cut the nerve to uh, obtain that 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 same result. And so for me, it's quite efficient in the operation. I feel like I'm getting very accurate recording uh, as I'm doing the case. And I think it's very important to cut a significant portion of the nerves to get the response that you want. And there are studies ongoing in the United States now amongst a, a small group of us who do this uh, procedure, and there's significant variability in the methodology of how folks are doing this in terms of how much of the nerve is being cut or not cut, and how how people do it. I've I've tried to as I've uh, you know evolved my practice. It's very structured, very regimented, and very teachable. So there's not a lot of mystery in the way that I manage these. And because of that, we've been able to teach you know, all of our fellows who've now gone out, as I mentioned earlier, to be able to do the procedure because I can repeat it. And the methodology is, is uh, uh, fairly straightforward, uh, at least the way I think about it. Thank you very much. Of course. Well, thank you. Hello. Yes, we can invite okay. comments from Professor Matis. Yeah, it was an amazing talk. Thank you very much for it. Two questions. If you yes, have sir. a child with uh, intertecal baclofen therapy and the clinical result is not good, would you consider this child for rhizotomy or is the intertecal baclofen therapy a contraindication for this procedure? Yeah, great question. So we have definitely taken kids who failed baclofen uh, pump management and done a rhizotomy. Often it's because they've either, you know, had an infection or for whatever reason, a family didn't like the pump. And we've gone on to successfully do rhizotomy in those kids. The opposite is also true. And it's really important. We didn't touch on this, that I often counsel the families that if they want to try a rhizotomy, which is a single procedure and they're done, if the effect of that is good, then they're done. But it doesn't preclude them from getting a pump. And so we have had 
some kids, especially the ones who are GMFCS5s, where we did a ventral dorsal rhizotomy, the effect wasn't quite what the family was hoping for. We still went back and put a baclofen pump. So you don't burn the bridge to be able to do a baclofen pump if you do a rhizotomy and, and vice versa. The same is true that you can do a baclofen pump. And if for whatever reason, the family's unhappy or you're unhappy with the therapeutic benefit that you're seeing, they are definitely a candidate if they meet the other criteria to have a rhizotomy. Okay. Thank you for that. And uh, in patients who already had baclofen, did you have any intraoperative surgical problems to identify the nerves or the quality of the nerve structures uh, were, was okay? Because sometimes after the application of baclofen, maybe the quality of the tissue is not that good. Yeah, so interthecal baclofen, uh, I have not seen that be an issue. The, the the issue that I have seen in baclofen pump converted over to rhizotomy is that they can have some arachnoiditis from you placing the catheter. And so it doesn't really significantly impact the operation. It's just something to be aware of. And the same goes the opposite direction. If you do a rhizotomy and then you're going to place a uh, baclofen pump, Sometimes you can have arachnoiditis, arachnoid adhesions, uh, and so passing the catheter can be a little more challenging in some cases, but I've never uh, had a case where we weren't able to place it. But the actual quality of the readings from the nerve, the tissue quality, I have not seen that impacted from baclofen therapy in the cases that we've done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh Professor Brown, first of all, I would like to congratulate you for the wonderful work you have been doing, giving a good quality of life and hope for the families who have children with uh, disabilities and your work is really commendable. Congratulations. Uh, one question I would like to ask in continuity with Professor uh, Dr. Mattis is that you said one uh, procedure may be added as a supplement, as uh, you said, uh, after a cells is not so good, you can for a, a selective rosal rhizotomy, you can add a pump later on. So, what is the best time to evaluate the success of a surgery? Because, as you said, the children need a long term rehabilitation. And when is the time you decide that, uh, yes, now it's time to interfere and the child does, did not have the intended results? No, thank you for that question. So usually it's a fairly delayed thing, right? So the rhizotomy and the recovery from rhizotomy and, and leveraging the rehabilitation to, you know, in effect, allow the neuroplasticity to occur and the end result to happen, that, that obviously takes, you know, weeks and months. So typically, if it's a diplegic uh, patient and we're not finding the results or whatever it is with uh, that child that leads us to think that they need a pump, it's very uncommon that we're going to place a pump before a, a year or more after the operation. That's not to say that, that you couldn't do it. You certainly could, but we generally want to give the benefit of the doubt and give it some time to see if the rhizotomy is effective. Now, for the patients who are GMFCS5s, there's profoundly impaired affected. If we do a ventral dorsal rhizotomy, Usually, if it's going to be successful, you know that right away. And typically, if we've had return of tone, it's come within about three to six months in those patients where if, even though we've cut, cut a significant number of the nerves, they figure out how to rewire things and the tone comes back. So in those patients, we've gone forward and placed a pump earlier and so typically that this is a very few patients. So I don't want to say the N is, you know, hundreds and thousands here. It's, you know, several patients over the years where we've gone then and placed a pump. And that can happen again at any time, but typically it's been at about six months after the uh, ventral dorsal rhizotomy, where we didn't see the effect we wanted. And then we moved on to pump placement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, my co-host, Dr. Liwoon Singh, any questions from you? Thanks, uh, Raja. Thanks, Prof, for a very nice, uh, fascinating uh, uh, talk. Uh, Professor, I want, want to find out from you three main three things. Uh, what is the best age uh, to perform such surgery if you get the patient? Uh, second question, Prof, uh, does it affect the 
uh, proprioception of the child, mean the, the inability to walk in dark. Uh, would that uh, uh, any case that you have experienced? Uh, my last question, Prof. Do you perform surgery for the carer, uh, for the emotional part of the carer, especially those with severe CP? Uh, because some people were saying that they, they did uh, perform the surgery just for the emotional part of the carer. Do you do so, especially those uh, non-ambulating children? Thank you, Professor. To ask me your first question again, sorry. <laughs> Uh, the, the age, the best age to become. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. So, you know, we can do this at any age, but it's best to find the kids early. So one of my biggest challenges is educating uh, the pediatricians and primary care doctors that they shouldn't keep the kids with high tone on oral baclofen or just do Botox for years and years, because those are the kids, again, with high tone that will develop contractures and other things. So the general in the literature reported age range is around three to eight. But again, my advocacy here is to find the kids earlier. So my preference in a perfect world would be to have kids who are like four or five that we're doing this surgery on. But again, having said that, I've operated on adults uh, with good outcome from, from the procedure. Um, you, uh, Sorry, as it's early here. Tell me your second question again. Uh, <laughs> uh, proprioception, affect the proprioception. Uh, yes, yeah. So, you know, it's an interesting thing, right? That you can cut a significant number of the sensory nerves and not lose proprioception. It's quite shocking and the human body is always amazing, right? In the nervous system that you can cut 75% of the nerves and the kids don't notice it at all. So even with this selective ventral dorsal rhizotomy, they still have proprioception. So you worry, right? If you're going to cut a lot of the nerves, are they going to act like a spinal cord injury patient where they would get bed sores or not be able to reposition or they lose proprioception? And when you cut about 75%, I have not seen that in a single patient. Why, I cannot tell you, but it is it, it is the case. And that, ask me your third question again. Uh, uh, surgery for the carer rather than the patient, the yeah. emotional carer. Yeah, you know, I would say that we don't operate purely for the emotional standpoint of it. Um, everything is done based on, you know, the clinical uh, evaluation of the patient. Having said that, the emotional impact of this operation is profound because the families of the kids who are ambulators, uh, they do so well. Uh, it's, you know, quite a moving thing a lot of times when we see the kids back for visits. And again, I mentioned in this is a frustration for me that these things are not widely seen in the literature, but you know, it's things beyond the tone, right? How are they doing in school? How are they interacting with friends and family? Are they able to go on vacations and, and walk a mile with their family at Disney World, right? Like things like this are emotional, profoundly life-changing for the families. And I think for the kids who are often not communicating uh, when they're GMF CS level five, that we're doing ventral dorsal rhizotomy. A lot of these kids are constantly in pain because of the high muscle tone. And we've heard from the families too, that these kids are significantly happier. They're more comfortable. And you can imagine as a parent, if your child is in pain, uh, you know, that's a distressing thing. And so High satisfaction in these procedures comes both on the functional side of what we provide to the patient, but also emotionally on, on that, that side of it, uh, seeing these kids do well, um, I think really, uh, it makes everybody happy. It certainly makes uh, me happy as, as the surgeon to see those outcomes. Thank, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor. Dr. Yang, would you like to ask any questions? Okay, I just have one question. And um, if this surgery is useful for the patients that um, is the brain injuries or the patients like uh, like uh, our patients disorder of consciousness. So this patient also have the um, uh, capacity and uh, they all uh, they can't uh, move there. 
their uh, likes and uh, just like the children, but I don't uh, know if the same, um, if, if the mechanism is the same. So I want to uh, ask a question if it's useful for the patients with uh, brain injuries. Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And I think this particularly pertains to selective ventral dorsal rhizotomy. So these are non-ambulating patients. They're going to be, you know, bedridden most likely from their traumatic brain injury. They'll have very high tone from that potentially. So we've, we've operated on those patients with mixed results. Um, you know, some will benefit from uh, the rhizotomy and, and others we've had some return of function. I think it's still early days and we're learning about the ventral uh, dorsal rhizotomy in which patients are, you know, excellent candidates and which patients may be uh, uh, patients that see return of the tone. Um, in brain injured patients, a lot of the tone is also dystonia, right? And so the regular rhizotomy obviously is not the correct procedure, but eventual dorsal rhizotomy is certainly an option. And the way I manage this is I extensively counsel the families that, you know, we're going to try this this isn't going to hurt the child. Uh, the main risk, again, is urinary retention, and we counsel extensively about that. But if you try it and it works, you've avoided a pump. And pumps, you know, I, I pumps are great in many ways, but they're also very complicated, right? And you know, risks of implantation, management of the pump, et cetera. So while I do a, a ton of pumps, if it was me and that was my kid, I would try a rhizotomy and see if it worked. If it doesn't work, then you put a pump in. If it works, you've saved yourself an enormous amount of management of that kid, right, as a parent, bringing him in, getting refills, doing all of those different things. So I'm keen to understand and explore this more as we offer this to more uh, patients. But the ideal patient, I don't think is quite known yet for the ventral dorsal rhizotomy. But I don't think it it, it, it also is really excluded from anybody at this point either. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we can conclude this session and hear the final remarks from our Honorable Chair, Professor Morota. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, fine then. So I'll wind this up officially now on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yuko Kato. I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Dr. Yi Yang and Professor Samuel Broad, as well as the Chairs, Dr. Georgios Matis and Professor Nobuhito Morata for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. A special thanks to our Vice President, Professor Shubin, for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. And as I mentioned earlier, we have around 750 people who are watching us live as of now. A special thanks to my co-host Liu Bun Singh also for joining me today. So until we all meet on the 6th of December, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.